welcome to another instalment of Brave Stories. I'm Amy Jenkins from Channel 4 and I'm here today with Danny Whitescorn who is here to talk about his story around addiction and mental health. I know that unfortunately a lot of people will have been touched by these subjects, I certainly have been in my life. Um, it would be really good to understand what what you kind of went through and, and, and at what point you kind of realised that you needed to make a change to your life and what those circumstances were. Well, firstly, thank you for getting my name right, because no <laughs> one ever, <laughs> no one, no one ever gets it right, let alone pronounces or writes it. Um, so, thank you. My my journey is probably not dissimilar to others, um, but I'd say the only difference for me was that when I was younger. You know, I had to overcome some difficulties. I had to overcome some grief. Uh, you know, I lost my mum when I was seven years old and it's challenging to try and reconcile that at that age. And as you grow up, I think you start to, you start to realise that you're missing something and therefore you have to try and find a way to fill that void. And for me, it was trying to, I guess, fit in. And the only way I knew to do that was just join you know what everyone else was doing um so when you say what made the decision it's not it wasn't it's not just as clean yeah. cut um because there were lots of times over my life where i could have made a decision yeah. to actively go the other way in a more positive direction but yeah. the same in the same vein i i I didn't know, I couldn't distinguish what was right and what was wrong. Yeah. But I'd say probably if you're looking for a marker and a milestone, um, it was when I was about 22 or 23 and I'd realised that I was sick and tired of being sick and tired and I had enough of behaving in a certain way, carrying myself in a certain way, um, not being responsible, accountable and doing things I didn't want to do. Yeah but continually doing them uh, and I just had to kind of draw a line under it. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about what your lifestyle was like in the lead up to that kind of age of 22, 23? Life, my lifestyle was, I had a good lifestyle, it was fun. Um, I remember, you know, I go as early back as 13, 14, being in school uh, and, and actually whilst I lost my my mum from a young age, the real trigger for me um, to have an overindulgent lifestyle was probably school because I just didn't fit in. I went to a school where I was in a minority and uh, in that respect, I, I didn't feel like I could be who I wanted to be. I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. So the immediate kind of uh, resolution or, or kind of antidote was just join in with the people that perhaps were doing the things that weren't as socially acceptable. <laughs> um, and um, I think all the way through school, I, you know, I, I remember just you know, going out of class, you know, halfway through or you know, breaking out at lunchtime, break times, whatever it was. And, you know, it, it just, I felt it, it was exciting, it was exhilarating, yeah. right? And then, you know, fast forward past school, actually, when I was between the age of 16 and 19, life was great. Um, the only issue was that I didn't appreciate what I was doing was having an impact on those around me. Okay. So I was, I was asked to find somewhere else to live at the age of 16, um, rightfully by my family, because I just wasn't I wasn't living by the rules, yeah. right? And it's not that I was in a dictatorial household, but I'm 16 years old. I have to appreciate that there are boundaries that I need to respect. Um, and at that point, honestly, it was it was amazing. Like the the the, the gates opened, and I, I was free to do whatever I wanted to do. So you know, all the way through my kind of young adult years, I could just do whatever I wanted, and thought there would be no consequences because you know at that age you just you don't think about you know, what's going to happen in the future. You just live for that moment. Um, so it was fun. But I think now looking back at it in reflection, it was probably overindulgent because I was masking for, you know, the inadequacies, you know, the kind of low self-esteem and all the other kind of 
you know, challenges or behaviour, character defects that I, I kind of felt in myself. And so when you kind of started to make changes, I know you went through a 12-step programme because we talked about that before. Um, first of all, how was that? And then second of all, did you find that you had to deal with a lot of stuff that you hadn't already dealt with from your past as, as a result of that? When I decided that enough was enough, and and I said this before, and I'll say it again, and I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, um, it was actually quite easy to embark on getting some help, you know. I guess when I was younger, my dad had tried to take us to therapy when we, you know, lost my mum. Um, but I don't think I was open to it. I don't think I was receptive mm. to what the, what the, I guess, agenda or output was going to be, if that makes sense. It was just like, go to therapy. You need to be here because you've lost a parent. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't reconcile that in my head. And, and actually went and saw several other therapists as I was, you know, um, before I'd actually gone into, uh, in, uh, into a 12 step recovery program. But I just, my, my, I wasn't open to it. Um, so when I made a decision to kind of, I guess, take myself away from the things that I was doing and enter into a, a 12 step recovery program, I was ready for it. it. There was just no, there was no question. It was like, I, I just needed to hand myself over because I couldn't control my behavior, my thinking, um, my actions anymore. Um, did I get more than I bargained for? Yeah. Um, do I get that every day? you know, uh, in this in this present moment, yeah. Um, because part of what I do now, it goes beyond a 12-step program. It goes into just morally what's right and what's wrong. Mm. How do I keep my side of the street clean? Um, I think the hardest thing that I had to deal with was the grief and the loss of my mum, which um, on the back of just I think really impacted how I kind of positively move forward from there. Yeah. And so your lifestyle now is quite different when we've talked about it and I know lots of amazing things have happened. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what what life looks like now for you? I mean it, it's beyond my wildest dreams. I just I can't I mean I, I feel warm as I say that now because if I think back to, if I think back in the stage of my life, think back to a seven-year-old me, you know, a scared little boy losing a parent. If I think back to when I was 14 and was kind of being bullied in school and then decided to join the bullies, you know, through to when I was asked to leave home at 16, um, to now I have uh, an incredible job, you know, with an incredible organisation um, that I wake up every morning and I love going to, um, even if it is in my garden or in the <laughs> office, um, through to having a partner uh, of which is 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 my soulmate. You know, she, you know, Kelly is to me is is what carries me through. You know, and even to the extent of, you know, having Harry, who is my stepson now. I never wanted children growing up. Um, it wasn't on my roadmap, it wasn't on my agenda. And all of those things, and, and, and relationships with my family and my friends and, you know, being able to help people, you know, overcome some of their challenges with, you know, mental health or addiction. Um, it's just, it's immeasurable. I can't. I, if I could bottle it and sell it, I'd be a very wealthy guy. But I, you know, all I can describe it as is a life beyond my wildest dreams. That's so lovely to hear, and I'm sure Kelly will really appreciate that as well. When you Name drop. This? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so obviously, you you worked. You weren't in media at 22, 23, where you, and you, you kind of joined after that point. Um, I think it's fair to say that. Anybody that's worked in media for a while um, definitely will recognise that there's a heavy drinking culture and, and probably a bit more, um, and probably still is, though it, it is changing. Um, how have you navigated that, and, and do you think it is problematic for people? 
it's, it's probably important to touch on, again, what I did before media, yeah. because I think if you don't know the industry, it, it can come across like that. You know, there are programmes out there like Mad Men where yeah. <laughs> there is that old advertising kind of era um, which depicts this kind of overindulgement, overindulgent, you know, smoking cigarettes, drinking whiskey. That, that world doesn't exist anymore, right? Yeah. But, you know, when I, before I joined media, I actually was in a totally unrelated industry. I had a, a car valeting, car cleaning business for about eight years where I just used to go out in my van, clean cars for people that had, you know, I guess disposable income yeah. and, you know, vehicles that were, needed to be maintained, right? Yeah. Very comfortable people. Yeah. And I think for a long time, I, I thought that I'd achieved real success, right? And I've got a business, I'm earning money and everything's good. And, and yet, aside all of that, I was still waking up in the morning and doing things from 6 a.m. through to, you know, very late at night, which helped me kind of carry myself through mm. and then if I if I kind of fast forward to the decision where I I realized it wasn't enough for me um, both emotionally um, you know too much physically I decided to sell up and go traveling around the world now to anyone that hears that might think oh you know it's great you know he had loads of money or did it you know the truth is I had nothing you know I had a I had a business that was was a lifestyle um, that kept me comfortable in terms of paying the bills and, and whatnot. Um, but when I actually came back, you know, I was struggling with what I could, I could do. And actually the first thing that came to my mind was TV production. Um, yeah. So it was, it was interesting to try and, uh, I guess, understand how do you move from being in an organisation or being in a, in a world which is like cleaning cars, let, let's yeah. just call it what it is, um, to working in TV production and media. And actually the first thought that came to my mind was, you can do whatever you want there. You can drink, you could yeah. overindulge in anything you want to. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I would say that there is a heavy drinking culture, yeah, Media Thursdays or whatever, yeah. whatever it is. Um, but I, I can sit in any environment now with clients, with colleagues, and not feel the need to ever have a drink and for anyone to say anything to me. It's the pressure that I put on myself yeah. that I think forces, um, or, or would force me to put myself in a, in a compromising or uncomfortable position. Yeah. So moving into your role and your kind of, you know, ha your the role that you do at Starcom, people often talk about like an addictive personality when they talk about addiction. Do you, do you recognise that? And if you do, do you feel like there's some benefits to kind of having that sort of personality when it comes to work? Interesting question, and <laughs> I definitely won't let Kelly see this part of the, uh, the filming. Um, in no uncertain terms, I'm definitely addicted to work. Okay. Um, and, 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 and what I've learned about addiction is it's very easy for me to replace, you know, one thing with another. So if yeah. it's not once upon a time, my job in chemicals, it's shopping. Yeah. If it's not shopping, it's exercise. If it's not exercise, it's work. Now, these aren't bad things, and I think that's, that's the important distinction people need to understand is um, everything is good in moderation. Yeah. Um, and if you have self-awareness around it, then that's, that's the key thing. Um, I, I love my, my job, I love what I do, mm. and therefore it's hard for me to be anything other than 150% um, all the time and I'm quite frequently told off your phone or why are you working so late or you know like it baffles me how you just fit in so much um, I think there are there are benefits but you have to be aware of what you're yeah. compromising on from a personal standpoint so for instance for me I know that when I work till whatever time I work till, or when I start working really early, that's a compromise on family time. Um, and it's a compromise I'm willing to make because I've seen the material benefit from that. I'm just gonna say it, the more I put in, the more I get out, mm -hmm. right? The more I hand raise, the more that 
you know, I am recognised for the efforts that I put in, right? It's, 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 it's risk to reward. It's the, it's, it works in any industry, any environment, you know, any circumstance. Um, but I, I do have to compromise. What I've learned, I think, which is, I think, really important, is not to allow that to affect my team and not to make them feel like they have to emulate that same work ethic. So it sounds like kind of one of the things you're saying there is about is around kind of that that perception of infallibility that a lot of leaders have and the, and the kind of lack of vulnerability. Do you think that's more pronounced for men than women? I think there's a perception that men are okay. I think there's a perception that we're you know the the alpha of the species if you you know if you want to kind of use terms that others have used and as a result we we don't need to talk and we don't need to take a step back now in my experience men are the most vulnerable they just feel from society that they can't get mm. vulnerable um you know, I, I can't speak on behalf of people I work with now or people around me. I can only speak for myself. And if I don't open my mouth and if I don't share what's going on for me, all it does is, it's what I call it, I, I refer to them as sitting tenants in my head. They're people that are up there, but they're not paying any rent. And they're just living up there rent free. Right? And that, that to me is the crux of everything that I struggle with day to day. You know, do I, do I have challenges with feeling less than? You know, do I have challenges with feeling more than? You know, do I think that I look right? Do I think that I sound right? Do I think that I said the right thing? Did I say the wrong thing? If I did say the wrong thing, did I obsess about saying the wrong thing for three <laughs> days? I, you know, mental, mental health for me exists in all of us um i just don't think that men feel comfortable saying all the stuff that i said there mm. that is a perfect segue into the next part which is going to be our kind of final final thought for me really is if if somebody watching this today is struggling with addiction or thinking starting to think that that might be getting to be a problem for them or even with their mental health what what would your advice be to them what would you like to leave them with You've got to want to change your own life. You know, no one else can do it for you. You have to be able to identify either that you have a, an issue with mental health, you have an issue with addiction, you have an, an issue with, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, you have to be able to identify first off. Um, you know, and it's your choice as to where you get off on that elevator, right? Mm. You can either hit rock bottom and be on the floor and not able to pick yourself up or you can actually identify it and choose to kind of open the doors and, and get out a little bit earlier and seek some help um, and you know if you are struggling then feel free to drop me a note you know you'll probably find me on google um, somewhere on some social channel so if i don't work with you now if i work with you just connect in and just grab a coffee and have a chat because i've been there and, and I, <laughs> I go there every day, in fact, in my head. Um, I just have to, uh, in fact, I, he I heard this last night. I'll finish on this. Um, uh, it's like every day, I talked about sick and tenants before, but here's another analogy. It's like every day I have, um, I have this, uh, this community, I have this kind of congregation of people that come into my head and just want to just wanna have chat, 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 chat. <laughs> you know, I start thinking about this, then I think about this, and I think about this, then what's this person going to think? It, it, it doesn't stop. And I just have to sometimes just say, stop. And I have to take time out. So every morning, you know, I have 10 minutes of what I call quiet time, mm -hmm. which just gives me a chance to center myself before I rush into the day mm -hmm. and the busy world that we live in. Um, and every evening I sit there and just take stock. What, was I a nice person today? Did I have a good day? Did I upset anyone? If I did, try and, try, try and make it right. Because often the reason why I'm struggling with all the other stuff is because I've just done things in my life and not thought about the consequences. So yeah, um, reach out to someone if you're struggling. 
that's a really kind offer from you and I think everybody will really appreciate it and I think you've definitely done something very good today so that's good um, thank you um, and we're going to leave it there thanks everybody for tuning in Thank you.